Pursuit of Podcast, a purely guest-centric show focusing on people and organizations that advance positive change. Positivity can be anywhere, and in a time of vast discord, the pursuit of is finding those who champion its causes loudest. Join us as we sit and learn about the pursuits of local leaders in their community. Let's go. Hello, good people, and welcome to the Pursuit of Podcast, where it's truly not us, it's you. I'm Ryan Buck, Artist Development, New Leonard Media, and with me is the boss, Mark Wilson, President, New Leonard Media. How are you? Hey, Ryan, I'm doing great. Got, uh, it feels like springtime out there. It does a little bit. That's enough of that. Just chat, chat, chat about us away. But more importantly, our guest today is Lisa Brady, Development Director, Great Lakes Children's Museum. How are you? I'm excellent. I'm really excited to be here. Thank you. I'm very humbled that you would ask me to be on a podcast. Really? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Oh, gosh. See, I talked about this before we started, but knowing what people are about to hear, that's shocking to me that you would be at all surprised anybody would want to talk to you about any of all of this. Well, I guess the older I get, I just feel like everyone has such an interesting story. I'm sure that you feel that way, too. That, you know, the more that you get to know people and when they have some time under their belt, they have done some really cool things. There are so many cool opportunities to do in life these days. Wow. Well, humility, that's on the list of yours now, if it wasn't before. But what what I really like, and, and this is a question that I started asking recently, and I just kind of like it. I don't know why. So let's say you're at a social gathering. Things are happening again. Can we call it a party? Yes, let's say you're at a party. Yes, okay. You're at a party. You're dressed however you envision yourself. It's fancy. whatever kind of, it's a fancy party. <laughs> <Yeah>. Okay. <laughs> so it's a fancy party. You're looking fantastic, feeling good. And it's one of those things. Somebody asks you, what do you do? What's the party version of what oh. you do? Well, I like to say I'm the development director at the Great Lakes Children's Museum. I am the one who does most of the fundraising. So I will reach out to people individually. I'll reach out to corporations and I will try to find people who are interested in what we do at the Children's Museum. And it's really about pairing interests because a lot of people, giving is makes you feel good. That's just the bottom line. And I think some people have learned that. Some people are in that space. And some people haven't grown up that way or haven't had that opportunity to be, to give and see fruits of, you know, their work. Well, that was the the party answer to what you do, right? Mm-hmm. I was so, hoping that someone would take over after that. <laughs> oh, <laughs> the well, other person, you know, at the party. Oh, well, see, that's yeah. my follow up question because now you have a semicircle of engaged people. Because mm-hmm. typically, an answer to that question could be on this their title and done. So it says something about the person and how they do the party version. Well, I have to take advantage of the opportunity to talk. If somebody asks me, I got to talk about that how museum. Telling, how telling? Okay. So you have your semicircle. Now, one of the first things you said was fundraising. Mm -hmm. And do you think that is different than people are expecting? One of the first things to come out of your mouth as your job title? I do, to tell you the truth, because for whatever reason, I always think that people, um, I am blonde and I am, you know, short and I am bubbly. And I think and I know that a lot of times I can come off really silly or really laid back or just even flaky. And so I I don't expect most people to think that I'm going to say that and then that I'm going to get so passionate about it. Wow. So at these parties, do you feel underestimated right away? And that's an advantage? It is an advantage. I Maybe it's a, it's a blonde girl thing and a short girl <laughs> thing, honestly, because I love wearing heels and I feel so much. I feel like it makes such a big difference if I am wearing heels in a room, in a party, because when you can look someone in the eye, you know, which is not what I've done for most of my life. You know, we we (laughs) dive into psychology on this podcast occasionally, (laughs) and you've given a lot there because I I find you to be a very confident person. Your handshake's very confident, not overly confident. You didn't do that, like, bringing it in type of thing. (laughs) But being bubbly and being, dare I say, even blonde, like you said... The expectation is set at a different level sometimes. I think it's a powerful thing if you're recognizing that and you're able to read the room that way and use that to your advantage whenever you need to. Absolutely. So I would never, (laughs) ever discount those things. Maybe in some circles more than others because military background, you know, maybe that's actually where it came from because I did go in the military right out of high school 
And so my very early on experience was honestly having to prove myself to most people that I spoke with and engaged with for the next four years. Right. Well, we are going to get to that, but you've been in this current role since 2015, Mm -hmm. but the organization itself has been around for quite a while. Yes. Can you speak a little bit to any of the history? Um, It goes back to the late 90s. Yes, it does. 1999, um, a bunch of, a, a group of parents, basically parents who were interested in bringing opportunities up to the these rural northern Michigan kids because, it, you know, most people came from downstate and then uh, they have museums down there. They have different kind of cultural things for kids to do. They had different kind of groups. And then up here, since there was a lot less people, they just didn't uh, have any kind of you know, com- community outside of school. And so th- it, that was an educational, you know, system. So they wanted to uh, start that up. And so they actually started by taking uh, this big st- stuffy doll is what it was called. And it had insides that would come out. And so it had a heart and like organs, but they're li- but it was a stuffed animal. <laughs> and Interesting place it, to start. Yes. <laughs> and they would like <laughs> go into classrooms and they would teach in a fun way, um, you know, when people used to come and do that. Now now people don't really do that in classes, I guess, or we don't do that anyways. But that's how it started. And they wanted a children's museum. And they fundraised. And they got it going. That's what they did. And it's amazing. And the people that are involved in it are actually still involved and still check in with me. And it's an amazing group of people who have gone on to start other organizations. So, wow. Yeah. Let it be known that when you said that about those people still being involved and checking in, your face was lit up with delight and appreciation, which I think is good. But I'm really excited for this part. So you got your BA at Appalachian State University. Well, but let me just say, because one time before I went to Appalachian State University, I was down in Georgia and at a party and some person asked me what I did and I had just gotten out of the military and I said, I go to Appalachian State. And she looked me straight in the eye and she said, no, you don't. And I was like, oh, but I had just been accepted there, but I was going to start there in about a month. And I said, I really do. And she said, no, you don't. Because if you did, you would know that it was pronounced Appalachian State. Ho. Oh. Total zinger. School. Oh, so. man. School. Wow. <laughs> I, I accept that. Yeah. <laughs> Can we start over? Yes. <laughs> so you got your BA at Appalachian State University. Yes. And you graduated cum laude. Yes. Served as president of the economics club. Yes. President of the Students and Free Enterprise. Yes. Vice president of the American Marketing Association. I, I don't thought even know about this how this is possible. This is a really possible. long time. <laughs> uh, graduate of several honors programs. Mm-hmm valedictorian Mm. okay then you get an mba in nonprofit organizational management from lipscomb university yes go bison Mm -hmm. yes go bison (laughs) and before all of that you just talked about combat medic in the army Mm. what what's happening with you what 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 was the what was the dream reality and where are you now well i really I really wanted to, I like the way that you just laid that out because that's an interesting way to think about it. The um, I wanted to travel the world. I always wanted to explore. My mother always told me stories about her and her girlfriends traveling before she was married and then her and her mother traveling throughout Europe. And I just always wanted to do that. So then when I found that in the military, you would be offered that opportunity, um, I jumped on that. And I thought that being a medic, you, it's an EMT on the ambulance or um, in an emergency room. And so I just thought that can't be a bad skill set to have going forward. <laughs> and so I thought, well, go ahead with that one. And, you know, then I got into that. But then after four years in the military, really after about two, I decided that that wasn't the lifestyle that I wanted. And so... What do you mean I, lifestyle? Well, military is not just a job. It's definitely... Mm-hmm. Um, you know, a, a 24 hour a day thing. And it. Mm. Because on your LinkedIn, mm-hmm. you assisted in establishing a new patient referral system. Mm-hmm. You created and distributed company wide anthrax vaccination systems, yeah. trained and certified over 100 soldiers in, I, I think, life saving yeah, techniques. Yeah, the combat right? medic techniques. Okay. Yep. Wow. So, kind of twofold. <laughs> Why do you, I, those are amazing accolades. 
uh, it, it listed out incredible. Uh, the combat medic should suffice just in any circumstance. <laughs> mm-hmm. The fact that you got to and have to list all those things, but these are things that serve you well in in a lot of different ways. But when you fl- reflect on that, that's all part of the lifestyle of healing and helping. That's interesting. Um, I didn't think of it as that at the time because it was intense. So I just thought that I didn't want to be so intense, I think. But intensity, Mm -hmm. it can be directed, right? Yes. Yes. If you can control that particular... Right. You know, I had we had a couple of situations where we were transporting people uh, when I was in South Korea and they were they nearly died. And I 100 percent know that I saved at least one person's life by the things that I did in the back of the ambulance that while I know that it wasn't it's I can't I don't want to be responsible like that, I guess that's that was just so intense. I mean, I those people are way underpaid because that's. (laughs) <laughs> like, what if I had lost that person? I don't think I could deal with that. I don't know. Yeah. But it's but just like... But that was a reality but, yeah. presented with. But you didn't. No, I didn't. You know, no, I didn't. And, and that guy had like six kids. And I still am friends with him on Facebook now. And uh-huh. I was like... That's a yeah. beautiful story in itself. <laughs> I always look at things like uh, uh, zombie apocalypse. Who has value then? And I think when that time comes, like, oh, yeah. does anybody need me to edit a video? No. <laughs> no, but they probably need some medics. <laughs> and after we all hopefully survive, can you grow are food? Want to be interviewed about can how you build it? things? You know, we'll can you do save have a people? safe room? Uh, we'll yeah, be no. successful on the rebuild. I, I do, uh, but the survival. And you were stationed at Camp Humphreys, which, yeah. um, I mean, this is something Googleable, which is incredible to me. There's opening and closed hours. Mm-hmm. At the time I Googled it, it was closed. Uh, opened at eight a.m. <laughs> Uh, and, and things like the garrison commander's name was listed. I don't know if that should be on there, but right? you were in South Korea. Mm-hmm. You were 60 miles from the DMZ mm-hmm. and it was intense. And I, the way that you so casually said that, <laughs> it's almost implied that it was, but it's led you on an interesting path. Mm-hmm. So what was, you, you said the dream, the plan and the reality. So what happened after school? Well, so I couldn't, um, I wanted to go to school. I knew that I didn't want the military, or I was just ready to move on with that lifestyle, with that chapter of my life. And so I wanted to go to school, and I cross-referenced schools with, I was so in love with Asian culture and had visited Thailand and all throughout South Korea. So I wanted to come back. But South Korea wasn't going to be it because South Korea is basically New York City. Yeah, Seoul. Exactly. Seoul, Seoul. Yeah. So I didn't have, there was no opportunity and I didn't speak the language. So at that time it was China. China was, you know, sort of the wild West frontier. Mm-hmm. And so I cross referenced schools with Chinese business exchange programs and rock climbing programs because I really wanted to get into rock climbing. It seemed like a really cool thing to do. And so I found Appalachian State University, and they offered an intern program for one year. You could be in their program, and then you would teach other people how to rock climb. You'd be an instructor. You'd get paid to instruct people. I thought, this is an excellent way to pay my way through college. So I you know, had to get into the honors. I knew what I needed to do to get the program that I wanted, and yeah. then I would get back to China. Uh, interesting. So you were inspired by rock climbing. And a valedictorian. That's cool. So I'm really inspired by this next part. You thought the first part was exciting. So first official job, purchasing and logistics intern with Fine Furniture Limited in Mm -hmm. Shanghai. Mm -hmm. Then moved over to a Microsoft joint venture, also Mm -hmm. in Shanghai. Uh, You did some sales and account management in Los Angeles, Mm -hmm. where after a short time, when given the opportunity... You increased uh, 21% revenue share for the fine folks at Chicken of the Sea International. That's true. Uh, and then back to TC, your roots as a business manager, then a little stint with Prudential in Hong Kong, then shoes uh, in Nashville. Mm-hmm. Are you a spy? <laughs> Is this all real? <laughs> this looks like some kind of witness relocation situation. Uh, but You've been it, in any balloons lately? <laughs> so, so okay, here's my actual question, because I know this is all true. Does everyone have to have such an impressive resume to be successful doing what you do? Well, 
You're very kind. I think many people don't have the desire to travel as much as I have. And also, you know, just like your whole friend groups and everything, some people feel very uncomfortable mm. in a suitcase in a new city and then making friends. And I did not. And one of the things that you said about that chicken of the sea, increasing the business, the book of business that we had, that we had had for many years and increasing it by that much was because of relationship development. And so they had a lot of business that they spread out among different um, suppliers and, you know, 3PL suppliers. And so with the re developing a better relationship with those people, then they gave us more business. And so that was a good learning experience. Basically, that everything is going to come down to your relationship, how people are comfortable working with you and interacting with you. Okay. That's a good point. And that could be maybe the answer to the next question is, of all of your varied experiences, what would you say is essential to your success in your role right now? Well, I think what is essential to both my role right now and just my entire life is was the military leaving at 18 years old in Traverse City, which is predominantly white, um, middle class. And then right after my training, it was the Bosnian peacekeeping mission. We had just moved into the peacekeeping mission. I went directly to Bosnia. And so we were building bridges, rebuilding orphanages, taking candy um, and toys to these orphanages and visiting people and building goodwill and driving through driving into Bosnia you know I would saw a, a house that was a half a house because it was blown up on one side and people were still living in it and so there were stairs that went up to nowhere and there were sheets up as their uh, walls and it it was shocking that people would live like that and then to go on you know that they have to live like that and then to go on and think that most of the world is closer to living in that reality than is what is our reality every single day. So I think being grateful for what I have every day and trying to provide other people with opportunities, um, that's that's a big part of my wow. mission, well, I guess. So being grateful. Mm -hmm. Yes. Interesting. And, and maybe it doesn't need the the dichotomy of going from the middle class world to Traverse City. And and I love how you put driving into Bosnia like <laughs> it was, you know, Milwaukee. Um because it must not have been. And in taking those experiences, because obviously it was very traumatic, but it created this intensity, but also another side of grateful. Mm -hmm. So what a cool combination. Yes. So when you took over in 2015, mm -hmm. um I, there's this tee up, there's this military background, there's this intensity, there's this, you're grateful. Mm -hmm. What was the first thing that you saw, however, that you really thought this needs to change and that was a focus? Well, I was doing research before I accepted the position and I researched the, the amount of rural children and rural families that are lower income you know, as I moved into this role, it just became more and more apparent and, you know, something that I just see on a daily basis. So I, you know, I just felt that I have been given, I have been allowed to see all of these things. The Great Lakes Children's Museum provides small children and their caregivers interaction points and some direction where they might not know what, what to do exactly. It might be a first time parent. It might be a parent who doesn't have a lot of resources. These are the the people that we fundraise for in the underserved support program that provides memberships and low income school groups to come in. Those kids aren't the kids that are getting to go to Italy for their spring break or even Florida for that matter. You know, so those kids are who it's going to really make a difference for because forming these brainwaves, the things that we know these days about ages zero to three and zero to five being so formative, it's really helpful to have that, especially when we're locked inside. A lot of people, you can't, you can get out and enjoy the, a lot of the winter here, but with a small child and you got to bundle them up and then you got to take them out and then they're cold after 10 minutes and it takes 20 minutes. Is this to relatable them. everybody? Yeah. <laughs> <At all>? So <laughs> it's nice to have some indoor space. And then also for 
adults to connect because I just, when you have a child or young children and you're at home and, you know, you're only, maybe you have someone coming home or not to even talk to, you need another, you need other adults and you need people to bounce stuff off of. And if they're under school age, you're not, you might not get that somewhere. Right. And something as corny as it may say, it may sound rather, um, is somewhat educational and developing their minds, developing their social interactivity. And is is it that kind of thinking? So that's that's amazing that that's something you identified and something that you wanted to do. Is there something right now that's in place that you're really proud of that helped address some of that? Well, actually, we did not have as strong of an underserved support program as when I started. We had passes available that people could get through agencies such as Women's Resource Center. If you happen to be there and then you had a small child and you wanted to go, you could get a pass for two people. Now what we offer is uh, $15, I believe, memberships that are for the entire year for your family. And all you have to do is have an EBT card and just flash it. This is, we are not trying to make you jump through hoops or whatever. We just want it to be available for you. And so how we have structured um, our revenue streams is that, you know, the people who are coming in and paying $8 per person all summer long, vacationers, and all year, but 40% are in the summer, they're subsidizing the other groups that people that just don't have that type of money. Right. And they, so we have this new program and then a lot of my fundraising, about 40% of what we need is fundraised for. Wow. So Well, and that's that's an interesting question that comes up uh, occasionally with guests on the show is a large part of your revenue is in the summer. Mm-hmm. Is that would that be accurate and then you have to do what you can Yes. the other months. Yes. Like like a lot of organizations and individuals in our area. Absolutely. Absolutely. And it um was frustrating. I mean, honestly, my boss was holding his check uh, in the beginning, he would hold his check and and pay me. You know, we're not in that wow. position at all anymore. And we have gone up on such a trajectory. But really being able to see that, and I mean, financially in graphs, we can see where everything, you know, has become better, that we both thought it was a really important thing. And we both wanted to do good at it. And we have made that museum a lot better than, and, than it was when we got there. Well, speaking of that, the is it that attention to maybe an underserved area that led to the 2022 indigenous exhibit that you did um because i i find Mm -hmm. that that story very fascinating you know it was was featured uh on the news here and there um and you said something really cool about that that i thought was really neat about your I, i believe a philosophy about you know how you feel is that you and you quote you're quoted as saying we hope it will spark conversations between parents and their children and a big theme is connecting parents and their kids. Mm-hmm. You know, sometimes you may think it's just about the kids, but it's that connection. But speaking of that exhibit, something that I thought was interesting was it was something that was, you know, created, the idea was created in 2015. And here we are, 2022, talking about it. So what did you learn in that journey? You know, why does it take so long? Is it is it difficult? Are there hurdles you have to get over just to make something like that happen? Well, I think fundraising is cyclical. And I think from the amount of DEI initiatives that we've seen recently being like the last five years, it really sort of came into fashion, as weird as that sounds. But not it came into fashion, but I guess people just became aware of it, right? It's, Mm. you know, it's always been, you know, a big deal, but it's, you know, just thank God came about now. So it really, when we first started fundraising for it, it was not, on a lot of funders' radars. It wasn't very interesting to them. Mm -hmm. And then it did become interesting to them. And so the main part of that, you know, was we wanted to pay artists appropriately. And we also wanted to be very um, careful about getting, about asking artists to do what we wanted them to do versus allowing them to do what they Mm -hmm. wanted to do. Which is tough because they also don't have experience working with children. We're the ones who have the experience with children, but um, it's a new frontier for everyone. And so, or navigating the 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 diversity that you have to as a children's museum and and things that um, may 
trigger uh, a more controversial discussion that goes beyond what is appropriate for little kids and young families. Well, I, right. I never saw the exhibit it, itself, but from what I saw in the media that's out there on it, I, I love what you you said. You you wanted to present it as a potentially difficult topic that parents and their kids could engage with. And one of your artists did have a piece that really stuck out to me. And the phrase was, my culture was never your costume. And so it looked like you didn't shy away from a little bit of intensity in that exhibit, right? Because it wasn't just, you could have done a really easy, kind of nice little piece that, that you know, satisfied all requirements, mm -hmm. but it looked like it had some meaning. Was that the intention? Was it for to have some meaning? That artist pushed us. He really did push mm -hmm. us wow. and in okay. that. And so that was good growth for us. You know, we are settled in the middle. The, the things that are on the wall are a middle ground because we did want it to be a little bit more non-controversial and non... We, we just didn't know if we would get bad feedback, you know. Yeah, there there's... Uh... There, there are some other issues. I think I, I remember seeing the exhibit before the, the original um, and and some of it when it revolves around um, stolen sisters and um, and human trafficking and stuff, which is something that I think kids should understand should, you know, why stranger danger, why appropriate and inappropriate touch. I mean, those are those are really important things, but it's also kind of heavy in a public setting to drop on kids to be like, yeah, some people uh, want to take you. And, and unfortunately for this community, the federal government did for several, for several generations. And then it led to a disconnect in cultures that uh, now today is a problem where people disappear on our reservations and it never gets solved. That's a heavy topic for right. <laughs> little kids and young families <laughs> trying is. to get away, you know. Well, and and it, oh. the fact that it's, it's being addressed and in the way that you're addressing it and at the ages... So having said that, and not to take focus away from this particular topic, but knowing that it can be a five to six year process to get something like this, are you looking ahead to what the next thing may be to, to maybe it doesn't have to be a thing that we should be talking about this right now, or mm -hmm. we need to get this on a fundraiser's radar mm -hmm. as something kitschy, mm. let's say. Well, we generally have a timeline of three to five years for exhibits planned out, how much we can uh, change the exhibits, which exhibits can be upgraded and which will completely leave. And But one thing for kids is that things need to remain constant. So, you know, the routine is very important. So we did pull out an exhibit, the water cycle exhibit, and then kids were coming in and we were turning it into a new exhibit, but they were crying, Isn't that they were a screaming. Yeah. But well, it was <laughs> not the water table by the water cycle, but they, they they look forward to coming in there. And that is actually how kids learn is doing the same things over and over. But every time they come back, their brain is formed a bit differently. They have more of these cognitive connections. So they view it differently. And that's how those brain patterns are laid down. And so it's like you wouldn't not have fun if you went to the same golf course. Mm -hmm. You don't need to go to a new golf course every time. Mm -hmm. But we still do want to keep things changing because also the parents are our market. If the parent doesn't have fun, they're not going to bring their kid back. And so if they say, oh, man, it's boring all the time. Everything's the same. And we're like, but the kids need that. That's fascinating. <laughs> yeah. That is – that's a really smart – because as a parent sometimes – I guess you go to a place and you're like, oh, they thought about us. <laughs> and it's not just because they found a way to get beer or wine in there. Right. You know, it's <laughs> like they they thought about us in some way. And and that's a fascinating aspect of of what you do in the programming. So how involved in the programming are you and how much psychology, for example, is involved in this? Like you just said, you, you know, you can't just change things out. You know, a, a lay person may think, oh, kids' attention spans are short. You need to keep mm -hmm. switching it up and make people, give them a reason to come back, you know, mm -hmm. to pay mm -hmm. that price. So clearly it's different. Well, we we have a rotating part of our exhibit. Many museums are so much larger than ours are, and they have rotating exhibits that you can rent um, that will travel throughout the U.S. that are really exciting. But generally their, their footprint is as big as our entire museum. 
So we did this uh, smaller area in at the back. So directly when you walk in, though, it's the line of sight right at the back. So it would seem that things are changing more often maybe than they are because it's the first thing you would see. And so we wanted to have those rotating exhibits in there for about a year. Well, it's it's the the the, the psychology of you know of what you're doing and you know your involvement in putting those things together in the the time that it takes. Yes. So I'm actually not at all involved in the creation, honestly. Um, But what I will do is the education committee, which is made up of several board members, several community members who have experience, and then our impact manager and our education director, they work together and they are both educators, you know, trained educators. And so they know how to better do these things. Well, that's that's a fascinating part of this because you have to rely on so many things that have to do with the growth of kids. Mm-hmm. And although, yes, you are a museum, it sounds like you have this sense of responsibility. Like nothing is done in a in a manner that doesn't have a lot of cogent thought but behind it. Right. That's absolutely true. And that's, you know, the board members, the committee members that we have, we have an NMC Uh, Early Childhood Education, the director is on our board, and uh, one person who has brought the, or in charge of the 5 to 1 network and all of the neighborhood, just the really young childhood initiatives for um, Venture North is also involved, and they have been longtime people involved with us, because as so many things are changing, we can't keep up. You know that I'm not trained as an educator, So, I mean, I don't really make that connection, but what I can do is find out and listen and see what they're talking about, and it sounds sort of boring, and then I can think of a way for it to be interesting, and then I can tell you guys about it, and then you might want to donate if you think it's cool. Well, that's interesting. (laughs) Okay, so you say you're not an educator. Mm -hmm. I, I would maybe, I'm just saying I think it's different because you're contributing so much to education. But your perspective is different. So Mm -hmm. you may have that outside eye that Mm -hmm. makes it fun for somebody who, this may not be their thing. Mm -hmm. But you look at the connections between creativity and learning. And I think it's really interesting, the line that you thread. Are you a creative person? I would not say that, no. You would not. Mm -mm. And I think a lot of creative people or or people who don't think they're creative, do you feel badly about that? (laughs) <laughs> oh, I said it wasn't a gotcha type of like, show, but it looks like we gotcha. <laughs> Do I feel badly? I, I feel, I feel like the team that we have in place at the museum is honestly so good, and we call, we call ourselves the tripod between my executive director, our impact manager, and myself because I do the money, and the executive director does like the operations and what he does. And then the impact manager does a lot of the program management right. and and we each have our very strong. So right. it's good that we're there. Well, there. There's, so there's a connection between you know, creative styles of learning and there's a couple of schools of thought, but in general, you know, depending on what hemisphere in your brain are dominant, you still want both sides to interact in some way. Yes. So you have this platform. So do you find that In this journey, in this pursuit, over all these times and all this time working with kids and thinking about things for kids, it's altered how you approach your own life, your own trajectories. For example, I'm fascinated by a concept called functional fixedness, which is you're out of coffee filters at home. And you're like, oh, well, I don't want to go out and get coffee filters. But, you know, a little kid's going to go, well, why don't we take this uh, paper towel and we can make a coffee filter for you. And we lose that along the way. So is, is that something, again, you think has affected you or maybe completely not? You've stayed intense. Well, I certainly know that coffee filter trick and have done it many times because I'm not a very good planner. And so I wouldn't think to get the coffee filters until they're absolutely gone. So being at the Children's Museum certainly pokes at the playful side of me and the people that I'm around and hearing the children laugh all the time and seeing them smiling and screaming and splashing in the water and just being so excited is a fun environment to be working in. And if I ever feel kind of burnt out, I can just literally walk over to the bathroom and just like stand there and just look at the kids. And one of them, they're always doing something crazy. And, you know, 
that that ambient sound of children at play and happy. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That has to be something that isn't a bad bit of white noise. It is not. And the top, we don't have a top, like, there's some kind of mezzanine at the top of our place because it used to be a marine boat storage or sales room. And so it's just an odd. So we don't have like a ceiling that extends to the top. So we can hear everything that goes on oh, nice. out in the galleries most of the time. So if I'm working on something uh, that I need to focus on on my computer, then I'll usually put in music. Okay. Mm-hmm. So in your working styles, do you, you just talked about all the people who are helping you mm-hmm. and it sounds very diverse and you have a very diverse board, I am guessing as well. How important is that as a mix to surround yourself with that diversity? Because I, I mm-hmm. know it's, it's maybe assumed, oh, you need a very diverse board, but mm-hmm. sometimes maybe not. So curious as to your take. No, I think it is really good to have a diverse board. Um, we have, it is challenging to get diversity up in this area. I think we've done a pretty good job over the years of reaching out and trying to at least ask a lot of different people to come be on our board. Um, Funnily enough, a lot of people think that they don't have enough to offer, enough to give. And we see them and we see them on paper and we know them in the community and we think, what the heck, we would love to have you. Because we do want a mix of grandparents, young parents and non-parents. I'm a non-parent. So it's it's just good to have all the... And you know, you need to just know things about what is happening in your community, other activities going on. Are we going to collaborate with this opportunity? You know, if you don't have even enough people to be out talking, uh, like board members knowing what's going on, then they can't suggest collaborations for you. Right, and right. And it's really varied since when I came, I believe it was all women, all mothers and one father. And now we've swung, we've gone up and down, but now I think we're all man and one woman. So it's just, it's different, you know, it's different. I don't have anyone to help me plan the AHA party. So I had to ah, recruit outside people so, when before I had board members to help me with that. Well, and you have volunteers. Yes. And what what is the, you know, I, and I know we're all looking for volunteers and help, but what's what, what are qualities that you just love in volunteers? You know, it's kind of tough because we have a lot of events. And so especially throughout the summer, you know, everyone – with our mobile museum, which is amazing and can go to any location and has all these. And that's still happening. Yes. And that's getting better every year. Great. And yes, we got this amazing grant from United Way to make that one bigger and better than ever. Congrats. So yeah, because thank you for learning to be fun. It has to be awesome. Right? True, true. So you have to go there and you can all remember like when you went somewhere and you saw like those things i think they're called van de Graaff generators that you touch and they like shoot the lightning out of your hands is that the name of that i think so that's a great when you're dressed <laughs> up fancy at a party to bit right if that whole thing about what you do doesn't get the semicircle, <laughs> downshift yeah. into that van de Graaff? is that right. okay <laughs> thank you I'm i hope i'm right <laughs> oh, i think it's even more interesting if you're wrong because if you get into a battle about that right other people the best probably party ever <laughs> But it's just so the mobile museum is just getting better and better every year. And then hopefully, you know, it becomes people say, oh, well, if this is going on, what's going on in the museum? And plus, we have a a larger age range for the mobile museum. We have usually three tiers of activities based on the interest and the ability of the people who are in there. Right. And also that many families have multiple children. So you have to, you know, have something for a two-year-old and something for a six-year-old. So it can nice be to tough. Keep from there, yeah. It's a small amount of years, but mm-hmm. that can be tough. <laughs> Big difference for them. Yeah. yeah. And those are the fights at home that parents just want to be away from. Hey, your kids are four years apart, right? Correct. And, 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 mine and as well. And they're beyond having those fights. <laughs> and we, of that. I remember but the the difference. And, and they're at the age that I would absolutely take them. Mm-hmm. Uh, one of them's a teenager, mm-hmm. but. You know, and not just because I've spoken to you, but that's a part of our community and that's a part of learning. You know, my daughter's maybe interested in education. My wife's an educator. So this is a big part of it. So a question I like to ask, and this is a consistent one as well, but thinking about all those things, that journey, that's questionable whether you're in witness protection or not and all (laughs) these things, 
<laughs> and was there any advice you got along the way that sounded just insane at the time, but at this point in your life has become true or more helpful than you thought? You know, the advice of being able to take life on life's terms, I think is so helpful because I feel like that is what I try to do. The only times that I feel really frustrated in life is when I'm trying to make life go some other way. But as, as a, and then when I see other people when they're frustrated too, and it's way easier said than done, but being able to regulate yourself and, you know, just change your behavior to, to finish, figure out what you can do in that situation. And that's it. And that's it is what I can do in a situation. And the rest of it, it isn't up to me. It's, it's up to God, really. But I can see that as maybe, I don't know when you got that advice, but at, at the time seeing untenable or maybe crazy, but right. you no know, being real. So my final question for you, and, and again, I know this is not a hard hitting show, but it just, I, it connected with me as uh, an efficient myself. What's your craziest wedding efficient story if you have one? Oh my gosh. Well, I don't have where I was a quick crazy efficient, but when I lived in Nashville, my brother and his longtime girlfriend, who is Taiwanese, came back from Taiwan and visited me, and they wanted to get married. And so I was looking up officiants, and we needed to do it like the next day because they were just in town. And we got a guy who, you know, wore the top hat and sort of a what very cowboy type of thing. No, very or top hat, Sorry. like a sort of a top hat, like with coattails, but like a warlock sort of a person. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm just saying, wow. There, Long but he was the guy that we crystals? could get. He was, yeah, he was. I don't know about long fingernails, but wow. crystals, yes. At first, I thought Abraham Lincoln, but then you, <laughs> no, <laughs> you said like he a really warlock. took it in a different direction. So the Johnny but, Depp. But what he the... said was, if you guys wanted a theme, he could work with that because that wasn't his theme. short notice. That wasn't his, no, but yeah, that was just him. Work with a theme, short but notice. <laughs> he was like, I can, I this can get is a something for you. Person. I was like, wow. Oh, yeah. she he said, was. Uh, we're, we're having a normal person theme. I know today. normal theme. <laughs> you were, we, we, well, we'll go with the warlock theme. Thank you. <laughs> that wow, was included. <laughs> I that was so much more than I'd hoped for. Um, gosh, well, um, how? What's the best way to connect with you to support? To donate, to be a part, to buy tickets, is it the website? Yeah, absolutely. www.greatlakeskids.org has all of our information on there and it um, reaching out. It has a contact form, I'm sure, but yeah, or even just stopping by because we would always uh, give you, because if you don't have children, you can't come into the museum because that would be creepy, but if you ever want and you're curious about it, we're so happy to show anyone around. So, you know, we're always there and available. So I would love to show people around. And really what's exciting is that every time somebody comes in, they're like, wow, so many things have changed. And, you know, or they remember bringing their kids or it's the 20 some year old volunteers we have that are like, I remember coming here when I was a kid. And I don't know. Oh, it's just really cool. That is amazing. <laughs> yeah. Well, Lisa, thank you so much for your pursuits and to all those who pursue along with you ensuring kids and families and parents uh, have an amazing place to learn, play, and grow. This has been so awesome. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, again, the website is greatlakeskids.org. Is that correct? That's correct. Excellent. Thank you, Lisa. And to our listeners, thank you so much for listening and thank you for pursuing the positive. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining us one more time on the Pursuit of Podcast, the Pursuit of Great Lakes Children's Museum. Lisa Brady, my friend, thank you to you and the whole crew down at the Great Lakes Children's Museum and for all that you do and all your pursuits. For more information and to get involved, go to greatlakeskids.org. And as always, for all things audio, video, podcast production related, go to newleonard.com.